So can I please introduce to you now, Colette Phillips. Thank you, Joyce. Well, I have to say, and thank you to Bill, my good buddy from Boston. We hate to lose him, but Boston's loss is the World Affairs Council of America's game. So congratulations. Oops, I have to tell you that I was glad that I didn't, I wasn't the first free person speaking. Could I Because the last time I spoke early in the morning, like at 7.30, uh, into about five minutes, 10 minutes into my presentation, I, there was a guy in the first row and I heard, <laughs> <laughs> I looked down and I thought, my goodness, what's going on here? I can't be that boring. So I said to the woman sitting next to him, can you wake him up? She looked at me and she said, wake him up. You put him to sleep. You wake him up. <laughs> so I hope I'm not going to put any of you to sleep. I think I, we've had our, uh, our coffee break, so we should be alive and alert and awake. I really think this is a great uh, presentation following the Google presentation in terms of you know, how technology is changing the world we live in. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how demographics is changing the world we live in. You know, this is not your father's or your grandfather's demographical population. And um, at the turn of the 20th, 20th century, we had what was called a demographical shift. We are the new immigrants and the changing um, face of America was primarily of European, you know, Eurocentric. As we closed out the 20th century and moved into the 21st century, the demographical shift was very, very different. And with all due respect to Lady Liberty, the new immigrants and the new America is not you're tired, you're hungry, who are coming here to be yearning to be free. Many of the new demographics are people who are entrepreneurial, who are very highly educated, and who have really come here to innovate. They are the, for example, in Massachusetts, we have a large South Asian community, and one in 10 South Asian or Indian is a millionaire. They are, they have her. Uh, uh, innovation center that's in the heart of Cambridge, just about five minutes from MIT and 10 minutes from Harvard. And about, I would say, 80% of the people who are in the innovation center are primarily immigrants, and they're primarily either South Asians or Asian Americans. So this is the new demographic. So we have to change our way of thinking because when the conversation gets discussed in this country about demographics and immigration, we are only thinking about a small slice of the immigration population. People are mostly focused on either migrant workers or people who come here to work at the lower echelon. There is no discussion about the people who come here, like myself. I am originally from the Caribbean, and I didn't come here tired or poor, <laughs> wanting to be free. I came here to go to school. My parents paid full rate for me to go to college, and I returned home and worked there as the press secretary to the prime minister, and I worked in television. And then I came back to do my master's and told my parents I was gonna be there for two years and my mother likes to remind me, it's been 32 years, <laughs> so I don't know what happened to the other 30. But this is the demographics in which we are living in. So I just want to walk you through America's changing. The 90s was really the decade of change. We began to see the changes in the population. And even though way back in the 80s, we were hearing that immigration and demographics are going to change. I don't think people fully um, 
you know, acknowledged or believed it. So the 21st century is now reflecting that change. And if you look at the 210 uh, recent census, it really reflects a seismic, cultural, diverse shift. And I can tell you that just from looking at this map from the US census, you can see how the changes have taken place. You know, you look at Asians, you look at African Americans, and you just go down. Think about the, the, popula the white population grew only 5.7%. But look at all the other ethnic groups and how they grew. And then drop down to the Hispanic community. And they grew the largest. And if you look at these um, states, even Vermont, which is considered the whitest state in the union, had a shift in terms of demographics. So this is just to demonstrate to you that you know the numbers don't lie. These aren't my numbers, collect making them up. This is the US census numbers. And that's what the new face of America looks like today. That is diversity. And when I talk about diversity, am I primarily talking about in terms of racial and ethnic and religious diversity? So you have Latinos, you have Brazilians, you have Asian, you have Middle Eastern, you have African Americans, Caribbean, and people from um, the African diaspora. So this is it. Diversity matters in attracting corporate sponsorship. And that's very, that should be music to your ears because as you know as a nonprofit, corporate sponsorship and membership is very critical to keeping, to sustaining the growth of each of your, the chap, your chapters. And so when we look at it, the current immigrant population is more diverse, more multicultural, and more multi-ethnic and linguistic than ever before. And I would think with a name like a World Affairs Council, if you think of the emerging <coughs> economies of the world, they are China, they are India, Brazil, Africa, believe it or not, those are the emerging economies of the world and they represent large numbers. Here in America, I think, I like to think, we have probably the best laboratory of what a heterogeneous world looks like. And it works. You know, there, this is the only country I know where it doesn't matter what your background, it doesn't matter what your religion, you can be here and you can succeed. And nobody's gonna, you know, like tear you down or do anything. They, people are just thrilled that you're able to come here and you're able to succeed. So blacks, Latinos, and Asians, and immigrants are the fastest growing segments of the population. And for you to attract new corporate sponsorship, it means you have to start thinking about how do I diversify my board of directors? How do I engage people who are in this new demographic so that I begin to look like the world? I begin to look more like America. I begin to really engage people that are reflective of the global and the domestic marketplace. The other thing that happens is that corporations are also interested in looking at, and if any of you have heard of this new network called Fusion, let me see the hand, people who have heard of Fusion Network, they just launched last week. ABC, American Broadcasting Corporation, merged with Telemundo, the largest Latino network in the country to form a new network that they are calling Fusion. And Fusion really is about the second generation Latino Americans who maybe grew up with Spanish being spoken in the home, but they really primarily speak English, but they're still very connected to their uh, Hispanic heritage. 
I like to tell people that when people come from other countries, they did not check their cultural behavior, patterns, nuances, and habits at national airport. They bring them with them. You know, if you think about all of us live in communities where when people came over from what was referred to as the old country, whether it was Italy or it was Ireland or Poland or England, they tend to settle into uh, enclaves because people like being around people who have something in common with them. They can have the same foods, they can, you know, we have places in Boston, we have the North End, if you want a good Italian meal, you know, you go to the North End. If you want a good corned beef and cabbage, you go to South Boston, because that's a very large Irish community. So you know that people tend to cluster, and they hold on to the things that connect them, their connective tissue of their food, their religion, their culture. So it's no different with this new group of immigrants. And corporations are now thinking, bottom line, market share. How do I grow my market share? How do I increase my bottom line by really taking uh, advantage or looking at this changing demographics? And so they're looking for organizations that are attracting these people because this is who they really want to reach. They, you know, they're stagnant and they need to grow. So you become a conduit if you can attract, if you can demonstrate to the corporations that by sponsoring and being a part, being a member of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg or Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or DC, that they can reach this new emerging demographic. They're gonna to wanna to partner with you. So successfully addressing the issue are gonna require new strategies and collaboration. And I like to say there is no new strategy. All there is is something that's already out there that you can build on. You don't have to invent the wheel. That's the great thing about it. There, are, there is an abundance of opportunities that are out there. There are organizations that exist, whether it's Hispanic Chambers of Commerce, or it's the National Association of Asian American Professionals, or it's groups like Get Connected, which is what Bill partnered with my organization in Boston so that he could impact and reach and became friendly because when you come to Get Connected, you're meeting people from all kinds. It's, a, it's just like a, what I would like to call a salad bowl as opposed to a melting pot. Melting pot, everybody boils into a mulligan stew. In a salad bowl, you have a tomato, you have a car carrots, you have everybody stays their brilliant, bright mosaic, but they don't sort of, you know, mush down. And you get to meet different kinds of people. And so World Affairs Boston, Boston was a affinity partner of Get Connected. So here are what the trends are, and this is why you need to pay attention, because I don't know, unless you, I know something, or you know something I don't know, I don't think there is any chapter in this room that can say, we don't need any more sponsorship. <laughs> we, don't, <laughs> we don't need any more money. We have all the money we want, thank you very much. So I wanna tell you, I'm gonna let you in on a secret, on the trends that's gonna help you think through strategically how do we engage more corporations so that they see the World Affairs Council not just as a place that provides lively discussion on global issues, but also recognize that the demographics are shifting and you can help them reach the target audiences they're trying to reach. So globalization coupled with demographical changes are forcing companies today to think of the marketplace in which they do business and for any nonprofit as transcultural and multicultural. So that's trend number one. Trend number two is corporations are capitalizing on the new demographics. Because the last time I looked, 
$3 trillion is not exactly chump change. <laughs> so they are looking at this market and they're saying, wait a minute, that's $3 trillion. That's greater than the, the gross national product of Sweden, Canada, and Mexico combined. That within our own borders, we have a domestic foreign market that if you're not paying attention to, you are leaving significant dollars on the table. So these corporations are saying, if we target these markets, we are increasing our market share and our bottom line. And lots of companies are now creating internal market, what they are calling multicultural marketing departments within their marketing departments, or they are creating an officer or a director or a vice president whose job it is. I just got on my, um, my Blackberry, because I still believe in Blackberry, <laughs> even though I have an iPhone. For business reasons, I like my Blackberry. Somebody sent me an email saying, I'm looking for a VP of sales for this company that is now creating a line of natural food products targeting the Hispanic market. So they want a bilingual sales vice president who can help them market their products to the Latino market. So they're already decided they need to have to tap into that uh, one trillion plus market. And so what's the next, the third trend? So multicultural marketing has be, now become part of the overall business strategy for corporations. But whether they are domestic or global, there are, last time I counted, or I read, since that's a lot, big number to count, there were one billion plus people in India, a billion plus people in China, and I think a billion plus people in Africa, and quite a large uh, half a billion people in Brazil. So these are markets that companies are looking at. And here within the, the American borders, we have people from those countries. Boston has the second largest number of Brazilians living outside of Brazil. Massachusetts does. And how did I know this? You ever heard of the World Cup? Okay. When Brazil won the World Cup, I think the people in Massachusetts went into a tailspin because all of a sudden there was a spontaneous flash mob of Brazilians on the street, just like the, when the Red Sox won. And they're like, where did all these people come from? Well, they were hidden in plain sight. They lived in Massachusetts, but who knew? And so this was an awakening where people said, wow, where did all these Brazilians come from? They were living right there. Same thing with the um, South Asian community. I think I may have mentioned that one in 10 South Asian in Massachusetts is a millionaire. It's there about the third largest um, group of Indians, people outside of India. There is Houston has a large um, South Asian community, Boston, Massachusetts itself, in general, Massachusetts has another large, and then New York City. So part of the corporate diversity and inclusion strategies that companies are looking at is their marketing, their HR, their supplier diversity, their philanthropy, and the key word for you, sponsorship. They want to spend money where they're getting the return on investment. So, trend number four is what I call high-tech, high-touch. And I think Meredith from Google uh, totally touched on that today. You know, in terms of we dealing with a heterogeneous versus a homogeneous approach. So, just like the general consumer market is segmented, so too are the markets of diverse culture. 
They are boomers, they're Gen 44, they're Gen Xers, they're millennials. They are all, you know, targeted. You have the professional, the uh, business execs, the entrepreneurs, and the small business owners. They're all out there and they're all segmented into different markets. So the other thing that you should know, and why this whole Google um, program is so essential, is that blacks, Latinos, and Asians are more predisposed to social media than their older white counterparts. I mean, you people now use their, there are more people. I just found an astounding statistic that said, that there are more people in the world who own a cell phone than own a toothbrush. I'm like, what? <laughs> yes, there are more people in the world who own a cell phone than own a toothbrush. And it doesn't matter where in the world they are. You know, there are like 6.5 billion people who own cell phones and there are 5.4 people who own toothbrushes. Go figure. But, you know. Um, so that, that was very, that's, and when you think about how we use our cell phones today, we heard people, you know, that's the first thing I look at, it's right there on my night table charging. Uh, so when you wake up in the morning, some people use them for alarms. Um, you do a quick search, somebody says, oh, Colette Phillips, let me go on my iPhone or my smartphone, put her name in and see what comes up. You can instantly Google somebody or do research on someone. You can use your Google map to, as a GPS, if you don't have it built into your car, or you don't have a, a, a Garmin, you can use your smartphone to find places. So people are using their, so their cell phones, their mobile devices for all kinds of things. And for younger people who are the new demographics, the new professionals are in their 30s and 40s. So they are on Twitter, they're tweeting all the time. I don't care if you're in the gym. Maybe I'm too old, but you know, do I need to know you're in the gym? No, but these young people, they, you know, they, they want everybody to know where they are and what they're doing every moment of every minute of every day. So they're on Instagram, they're on Tumblr, they're on, uh, and you know, as, as the gentleman said earlier, Facebook is almost passing. Facebook is now becoming like uh, MySpace, you know, where they're now, Instagram is the big thing. You can upload video, you can upload your photos, and you can, people can go and see them, and Pinterest. So these are all the things that we should be thinking about when you are, uh, thinking about how you reach new demographics. So some of the market leaders, so if you're looking for people to sponsor you, these are the people who are really into the whole aspect of multicultural marketing. McDonald's, Procter & Gamble, MetLife, Nike, Toyota, American Express, Bank of America, City, Verizon, Allstate, State Farm. These are all companies, and this is just a handful. This is not even the full panoply or cornucopia of companies that are out there. They are all reaping the profitable rewards of effective multicultural marketing. And guess what? They're looking for you. They're seeking you like you're seeking them. Because they want to know, how can you help me in this market? So if you are smart, and I know there are lots of smart people in this room, you know, I'm not talking about political correctness. I'm talking about imperative. This is a critical imperative. This is about growth. And, you know, if somebody once said to me, if an organization isn't growing, Guess what? What are they doing? Dying. Dying. Exactly. So this is about your sustainability and your future. So Boston, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Get Connected so that 
These are the kinds of organization. I told Bill, I said, Bill, you have how many chapters? Maybe I should partner with all your chapters to create and get connected there. Um, so this is the, whoops, I kind of need to go back and hit the YouTube. If I hit the YouTube button, is that going to take me to YouTube? Okay, good. So this is, and all I have to do is this. How do I get it through the, no, get it through the speaker? I did, I did what you said, hit that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I did. Was there a teenager in the house? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, we need a teenager, a 16 year old. Yeah, so, so the volume. generation. So do I move that just so I can go? And then we did this, um, we celebrated our fifth anniversary this year. I can't believe I've been doing this for five years. And we never have less than, less than 250 people. The last, our anniversary event, the governor came as our special guest and we had to turn people away. We had like almost 700 people showed up. And of course, they were gonna call the fire um, captain because the, the, the location could not really hold more than 500 people. So the people stayed in line because as people left and nobody wanted to leave, they would let in one or two people. So if you didn't get there early, but that's the nature that people really want to connect. And so this year we did uh, an event we do, uh, in June. We meet six times a year, February, I mean January, March, May, July, September, and our next event is in two weeks on the 26th. And I um, had the pleasure of meeting Omar Sharif, Junior, not the father, the grandfather. <laughs> He's a little old. I don't think he travels anymore. But the grandson is adorable, and he is a member of the LGBT community. And he could not go back to Egypt because in Egypt, being a gay man, you know, in a Muslim country, it's just not acceptable. So um, he became a national spokesperson. And so we decided that's, a mark, that's also a community that's part of the diverse culture. And we had uh, an event that was really about embracing diversity in its fullness. 
and I asked him if he would come and speak because he was he is a national spokesperson for um, for GLAD, which is the um, the anti defamation organization for the LGBT community. And so, as it happened, the ABC affiliate in town was doing an event, um, doing covering Get Connected at the time. And so they came and covered this event with him in it, at it. And it was quite the event. Um, so I hope I got it right, <laughs> since we have no young people in the house. The show tra I don't want to show the transcript. Yeah, I don't want the transcript. I want the video. So it says recommended, most watch. So I, it says Boston Color, let me see, Boston Chronicle. I'm hoping that that's going to pop up. Okay. There should be an arrow, but I don't hold my camera. Okay, it's coming. Yeah, great. <laughs> That's the nature of technology. You have to be patient sometimes. Okay, there we go. Do I can just skate? To, to open it up, so I should go to. Still loading. Play. Still loading. This is on Chen. This is on the local ABC affiliate back in Boston. So you know they have a lot on their site. <laughs> I think you get the idea of what Get Connected is and what collaboration. It's like, you know, Bill didn't have to um, necessarily go out and recreate the wheel. He was smart enough to say, here are people I want to meet. And he can tell you, he has met a lot of people from the Latino community, from the Asian community, from the business community, because guess what? The corporations are supporting Get Connected. So their CEOs and their senior executives show up. So it's a great way to connect to potential people that you want to connect to to sponsor your event. So it's about cooperation, it's about collaboration, and it's about uh, community. That's, that's the, the three C's. Collaboration, cooperation, community. So you think it's ever going to come alive? <laughs> so I'm going to invite Joyce to come up, and we are going to talk and do a little interactive. Oh, there it is. We'll interact finally, I think. Do we have the volume? Do I just? Actually. Oh. Well, maybe we should just forget it, because it's buffering. So, it's not uh, moving forward. So. Okay, why don't we talk? <laughs> okay. Well, first, let's congratulate the letter of great presentation. It's really great. It raised a lot of issues for us to discuss. And, and again, we're going to make this very informal, so jump in whenever you have a question or you want to challenge something or you don't understand something. All right, there you go. <laughs> Patrick, go ahead. You were the kid in class, okay. <laughs> Patrick, you have a question already? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I'm not on trial here. What? What's the K for connected? Did oh, you already cover that? Yeah, let me know. I, um, about, in 2000, I created, see, I'm, I'm a person who, I don't believe you should complain about something unless you have a solution for it. Because, like you know, complaining isn't going to change anything. 
if you, if you see something that needs to be fixed, think about how you're going to fix it. And then you can complain and say, by the way, here is the way to change it. So Boston um, operated in silos. And as I was looking around, people were always calling me. I think I was Google before Google was Google. In Boston, I was like the human Google. People would call me out there and say, collect. I'm trying to reach so-and-so in the Asian community. Who should I talk to? And I'd say, oh, you need to talk to Uncle Frank. He is like the mayor of Chinatown. If he gives you his blessing, everything is fine. No problem. Or you want the Latino community, talk to, you know, Consuelo Fonel, or, you know, talk to Philip Barajas of Connect You On, or Alberto Vasayo, the publisher of El Mundo. So, People would always call me, and I thought, you know, what if I put together a resource directory that was called Kaleidoscope with a K, and, you know, to um, <coughs> use Kaleidoscope as a way for people to connect with each other. They could go to it and find organizations and people without having to call them. <laughs> well, now it wants to Now it wants to play. <laughs> And um, so when I started Get Connected, I wanted to keep it in the family of K's. And plus, the C for Get Connected was already taken on the internet. <laughs> that was, the Get Connected on the internet was about uh, technology getting plugged in. So I said, great, I'll just go with Get Connected with a K. Necessity of the mother of invention. Absolutely. So well, let, let, let's step back a little bit. We're supposed to be, again, talking about how to expand our organization. Yes, systems. absolutely. And, and the focus of this was, well, you can expand them by diversifying. I mean, that's basically the, 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 the underlying principle that we're dealing with here. But let's stop and talk about diversity. Yes. And give a definition of diversity. We, oh, we know about gender, and we know about race, and we know about culture and all. but. You know, many of our, um, for example, even with me, I've been starting the World Affairs yes. Council of Harrisburg. You know, I brought together like-minded people who care about international affairs. Well, I forgot about accounting, marketing, business, <laughs> all those other things that keep that are the business side. So give us a comprehensive definition of diversity that will guide our discussion. Well, I think diversity is really um, more of the driver it's about including everybody. You know, I think sometimes when people think of diversity, they think it's like playing musical chairs. You know, and in musical chairs, if you, maybe I'm dating myself, but in musical chairs, somebody doesn't get a seat at the table. I think of diversity more in the spirit of the Thanksgiving table, where you put in an extra leaf, you add some chairs to the table, and you bring as many people together to really talk about an issue or to support something. And it makes for a richer dialogue. It makes for a more um, you know, vibrant conversation. Because if you are talking about a certain issue, and that you are leaving significant people out of that dialogue, then you, it's like listening to the radio or to a CD, and it keeps skipping. So you're missing pieces because you're, the pieces that you're missing are the skipped pieces. So diversity for me is really about not being politically correct. It's not about being, you know, certain people are getting all the goodies. No, it's about how do we make our dialogue and our organization richer and more um, enhancing. How do we grow and make it sustainable? And it's a you know, necessity, because the reality is the demographics have changed. Whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, that's the reality of this country in which we live. And we can either bury our heads in the sand and say, well, I don't see anybody else. This is just it. all we can say. Hey, there's a brand new world out there. How are we going to engage all these people? And how are we going to get them to the table to be a part of this organization? And it's not, and that means we have to shift our paradigm 
because often when we think of diversity, we, we have brains, and our brain, even though we as people may not want to think a certain way, you know, something flashes through your mind. Somebody says, oh, she talks with an accent. So does that, is she highly educated, or does that mean she didn't go to school, or whatever it is, you know? So it's all about not allowing your brain to determine what diversity should be, and to say, okay, we have South Asians in the community. They are entrepreneurial. Last time I looked, that wasn't a crime. <laughs> you know? And they are bringing something to the table. They can afford the membership. They're going to help us expand our horizon. So we need to think about how do we cultivate them? How do we meet them? And it's amazing to me. I mean, as an immigrant, there is nothing more um, gratifying to have somebody pick up the phone and say, hey Colette, I really would like to talk to you. I am, you know, my organization is not diversified. It's very homogenous. And I would love to take you to lunch or take you for a drink and just talk to you about what are some of the things I should do to help bring more people to the table. Let, let's, I'm sorry, right, there's a question, but I want to ask one other thing so to, to, to lay this out. We talk about diversity, and we're all, you know, telling people to when we understand it, we get it. But it's hard. You're talking about opening your councils and opening yourself to having to manage different people. Right. The World Affairs Council, for example, has now, is now partnering with the African American Chamber of Commerce and a fellows from University of Pennsylvania, which, which is a Latino group, okay? But that brings, for example, we did the event together, the biggest turnout we ever had, okay? But I didn't realize that many Latinos don't come on time. Mm -hmm. And if they may come, they expect it's going to start a half hour to an hour later, that, well, they arrived and it was over. Because I started on time. But, so, but to get to know no, you have to what the culture and how to manage and the cultural cues, and to not get upset, and to not, you know, it's like, I tell my friend, when I do an event, I tell, I actually tell my black friends and my friends of color half an hour early, because I know that my white friends are going to show up. I said 6 o'clock, they're going to be there. So I tell my friends of color, it's 5.30. They'll get there at 6 or 6.30. So they'll stop down time. Or, or to simply address the issue and say, listen, friend, it's going to start time. So you have to. But anyway, you had a question. Exactly. See, we can say this. We can talk about it. It's just cultural. I'm Jay Bruns uh, uh, from the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. I have a very practical question. I can't see clearly. Oh, <laughs> I have a practical question about uh, accessing the diversity and inclusion yeah. network in in large corporations. We've started that a little bit. Um, I've uh, talked to our diversity inclusion officer, uh, vice president at yes. the company where I work, and trying to uh, kind of connect into our employee research uh, resource groups, which include uh, Hispanic Leadership Network, New Women's Network, all the other ones that you named. Yes. Um, but so far, it seems that, uh, you know, I get a lot of, oh yeah, that's kind of interesting, but I'm not sure it's developing new uh, new resources, new new uh, members for us. So my question, I guess, is um, it, I assume you've got some experience in tapping into HR, diversity and inclusion, and, and these resource groups. And what's, what's the, in practical terms, what's a good way to access them? Well, I think you started off with, a, with your, affinity, part, your affinity professional group within your corporation. One of the things that happens with affinity groups in, in um, corporations is that they have monthly meetings, and they're always looking for speakers. So what if you were to say, you know what, I'd love to, be, I know you guys look for speakers, I'd love to invite the president of the World Affairs Council in Connecticut, would you, if I could help you reach that person, would you like to have them as a speaker at your next gathering? Or you could do the flip, the reverse side, which is to invite maybe the leadership of those affinity groups 
to an event that the council is hosting. I know Bill used to do in Boston um, an event called Chat and Chowder. Chowder, like the Boston would <laughs> say. Chat and Chowder. And that was a great way to invite people because he would always have interesting, fascinating speakers from around the world, you know, from China, from the Dominican Republic, from India, who might be in Boston visiting. And so he would have somebody speak. And the other thing he would do is bring them to, if they were in town doing Get Connected, bring them to a Get Connected so that people now begin to say, oh, this is fascinating. You know, like the Asian people who come to get connected now see like 20 Chinese people in the room who are acting from China. And they automatically make a beeline and builds there to say, oh, you know, this is what this organization is about. And he has met several people that he has brought to um, World Affairs Council events so that they can learn more about the organization, what's its mission, what does it do. And I can right. see actually what you've done with Get Connected. I can see all of our councils doing that locally, to have some sort of fair or a conference where you are the catalyst That's to right. bringing together the disparate multicultural community. You could be the center of it. And then invite the corporations to come. They could come for job fairs. They could come just because they want to be connected with the leaders of these different communities. Mm -hmm. But they do it through you. Yes. Uh, I'm Cheryl. I'm uh, World Affairs Council of Seattle. Okay. And um, one of the things that I'd like you to address is sincerity. Because often we say, come to us, or we yes. have. Yes. But there is relationship building. And so can you speak to how we can develop relationships so that when we have those opportunities, the trust and respect and the, and the sincerity is built Absolutely. before we start to do it? Thank you for asking that question because relationships are, you know, I always say your network is your net worth. You're only as rich as the people that you know. And I'm not talking about your portfolio network, net worth. I'm talking about you know, the richness of your contacts and your database and your relationship. And so it takes relationship building is about crossing the divide. It's about a willingness to meet the person or the other people on their turf, which means going to events that the Latino community holds, or the African American community holds, or the Caribbean, or you know the Vietnamese. I don't know what the largest group of people who are culturally different in your community represent, but it's going to those organizations. And I guess I, I'm so glad you asked that. I guess one of the reasons that I became as successful as I have in building bridges is because rather, I didn't sit around waiting for somebody to invite me. You know, I'm just one of these curious people. So sometimes I showed up at events, I was the only person of color in the room. But it didn't bother me because I knew I was there for a purpose. My purpose was to connect with people. And once you interact, once you make that connection, People realize, well, I don't have horns, and I don't have a tail, and I'm not going to eat them. And, you know, I'm just up there to connect, and they want to talk to me like I want to talk to them. And you build those relationships. And once you have done that, once you have done the work, and they realize that you're authentic, mm -hmm. you know, you are, um, and again, I have to, I can only go on my relationship with Bill to say he's the example. You know, Bill got to know people in the Latino community or the Asian community by coming to get connected, by meeting them, by inviting them, by taking them out for a drink or lunch, or so that you begin to build a friendship. And it's amazing when you break bread with somebody, it's really hard to dislike somebody that you're sitting across the table with. From. You know, you can't pop them in the face. That's yeah. not the life. But you know? even on that same on that same note, for example, our council, 
we had all of this space at Temple University in Harrisburg provided for us, big office, we could use all the classrooms, and said, you know, it's a waste to just have us here. So we reached out and asked the African American, would you like to share the space? We reached out and asked the fellows from the Pennsylvania, would you like to have a place to meet regularly? Suddenly we're now partners with these organizations, and their people come to our events, we go to their events, and it really is not just us taking, but us having given something, something of real value, office space. So. And there are things you could do together. That's the other thing exactly. that you, you could do is to have what I like to call affinity partners. It's not costing them anything, and it's not costing you anything. And you know, like Bill was an affinity partner of Get Connected, World Affairs Boston. Their logo is on our website. When he was having events, we listed it on our website's calendar. We would hot list it and send it out. We'd put it in our, our Facebook it and tweet it. And so that it's just a way of, again, building that the real network, authentic, right. authentic. We have two questions here, right there, and then I think you had one, right? Okay. Yes, hi. Okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michelle Yan uh, with the World Affairs Council of uh, Kentucky and Southern Indiana. And um, uh, my question is, you know, we're always trying to get more of a diverse audience in the events. Um, the struggle is, and I don't know if this is to do with, you know, perhaps our marketing efforts, and maybe has to do with, you were talking about partnering, but um, oftentimes, no matter what kind of topic we get, we still get pretty much the same type of audience. Age group may change. Mm -hmm. Um, so in your experience, I'm just wondering, you know, is there a particular way of engaging uh, a, you know, culturally diverse audience, um, getting them at events? Is it the speaker events that we, probably most councils, regular hold, or is it through a different type of medium, or is it through uh, particularly social events that they, you know, people like to go to? I mean, that's probably the case for most of them, but in a more of a content substance-wise way, um, what might be a good format to engage a diverse, a more diverse audience? Well, I'll let Colette go into detail, but I'll just say this. What I have found is you've got to give them a role. So, for example, if I'm trying to get the African American Chamber to come, what did I do? I asked one of their, the president, to introduce the speaker. So that invite, or I present some awards <laughs> or something that really brings in, gives them an actual role in the, in the actual event, so. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, again, partnership. You know, like every year we do, in January, our oh, first Get Connected is, happens the, it happens the first, the fourth Tuesday of every other month. So um, January, always happens maybe within a week of Chinese New Year's. So our speaker is always somebody of Asian background. And what I do is I partner with NAP, the National Association of Asian American Professionals. So the invitation, the e site goes out and it says get connected in collaboration with, they now send it out to their 2,000 members and it goes out to me. So what happens is everybody wants to come because usually the speaker is of Asian background. It's a CEO who may be Asian or an entrepreneur or a TV personality. And so now they have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just get connected or the World Affairs Council posting something and inviting you. They now are a partner with you in hosting this. And then you just say to them, here's what my expectations are. I would like for you to send this out to your network and to invite the people who are members of your organization. And then, as Joyce says, you give them a role. You know, you have them speak or you have them introduce the speaker. And um, I give them a table where they can put their membership things out and they can engage people to become members. And, um, you know, last night, we, I wasn't in Boston, but my company did an event for one of the large healthcare companies. They had an event called um, Ladies Night Out, and it was focused on women's health. And their events in the past have only always attracted 150, 200. Well, last night they had 500 women. Wow. And the difference was, that we partnered them with 
a number of women's networks that I am involved with and listed those organizations on the invite, then send out an invite that those organizations can then send out to their members. So obviously, they now have skin in the game and we said we would have to give you a table at the event that you can promote your membership and your members. And everybody wanted to be there because now they're a part of it. So making people feel welcome is really the key. Yes. You had a question, Gordon? Well, I think you've really touched on the importance of building relationships because I know at the Minnesota International Center we do a lot of very diverse programming, we yeah. co-sponsor with a lot of organizations, but the key is in the follow-up. Mm -hmm. And so I have two quick questions. Tell, tell us a little bit more about what it means to be an affinity partner, mm -hmm. and then I'd like to see the case study, you know, talking about this relationship with World Boston and Get Connected, and how is that positively impacted World Boston? What's, what are some of the outcomes of this? Yeah, I'll take the first half and you can take the second half. Right. Well, okay. um, I would say that, of course, the, the, the affinity partnership was, I said to, to Bill, I'm offering you, you know, people say that nothing for nothing is not anything. But I'm off, the best things in life are often free. I said, you don't have to spend money. I'm going to put your logo on my website, which without advertising, we attract a thousand people a week as people come and we have job listings on the site and events and event calendar. And we're going to put you on there. And every time we have an event, we acknowledge our affinity partners from the podium. And it, often Bill is there and I'll always give him a shout out and so people know who he is and what the organization is about. And um, we also, he can send me his events in advance, and I will get them up on our website and on the calendar, and reciprocity. And we will promote it, and he did the same for Get Connected. And then the other thing I said, you have a lot of people that you, that comes through the council. So he has brought people, as I mentioned, you are out of the room from the Dominican Republic, from Poland, from China, and Get Connected is free. We don't charge, we, 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 you know, even though people have said to me, you really should charge at least 10 bucks or something. We don't charge. So if he gets to bring these people for free, and usually the organizations who host us, they want this audience. So they provide hors d'oeuvres, they provide finger food, and often what happened, because we do them in either upscale restaurants or hotels, people stay and eat and drink. And so on a Tuesday night, to have 100 or 150 people having dinner in your restaurant, that's a, an incentive. So that's part of the affinity partnership is, I like to call it the WIFIM process. What's in it? For me, and what's it for you? It's not all about Colette getting all the goodies. It's how can I help you? How does this partnership work in a collaborative and an effective way for both of us, where you win and I win, and both of our members win? So, Bill, how did you win? Tell me how you won. I, I definitely got the better end of the deal, Colette. No question. Now you tell me. Yeah, uh, but we're still working on the other half. Um, I, I have to say that, that Get Connected offers many things. First of all, it is the audience that I wanted World Boston to be. When you see her 250 people, it's really what that kind of energy we want. Her, her secret sauce fundamentally is, is, in addition to being an incredibly generous person, you throw the best parties. And that's really, that is a big deal. And she structures her events differently than we do. Um, it, is, it is very much a social networking thing at the beginning, but often followed by a book talk and signing, a panel, women who rock, small business leaders and what you can learn from them. So it's topical, but you get to them later in the program. 
Um, Ming Tsai, who's a, a famous chef in, in our uh, metropolitan area. And, and they're timed beautifully. It's not too much, it's, it's Goldilocks. And, and as Colette mentioned, we are, we're, we're cross-branding each other. And through her um, community, uh, mentors, up and rising leaders, they have been involved more in our young professionals activities, I think is our flow. And she actually had an event um, during a mayoral primary, which she was involved with the candidate. And I went to, hers is a movable feast, it goes to a different hotel or location. Was it? The Harvard. Sorry. I wasn't even there. She wasn't even there. I mean, this takes cojones. This is, I mean, she leaves her own thing. real word in another language. <laughs> that, she leaves her own thing, and it still has 200 people. It's, it's incredible. And, and I noticed, I got to, you know, we support it. I go when I can, and my staff does. And I make very sure to look at our members who are going, because we want to make sure they're getting the value. We know they are, but it's, you know, it puts us on the map in a great way. The connections to not only the governor, um, uh, Boston City Council leaders, and people in the corporate world are fantastic. And as Colette said, and it doesn't apply to all of us in the room, we are among the, the, the fraction of World Affairs Councils that are also in an NCIB network. So Carol, this applies to you. Um, as Colette said, we brought I mean, it was, it was uh, four, from the representatives of four religions of, of uh, Bosnia who came, and they were learning conflict re resolution, but they, they came to, to a small business thing at the Boston Fed. Loved seeing this kind of, I mean, it was eye-opening for them. It was valuable for us because it showed the other kind of exchanges that we build. And as Colette said, she always uh, gives a little shout out and, and really exposes us. So well, it does look like it's, it's really a collaboration. It's, 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 it's both. You yeah. just gained membership. And, and it, the one thing you said, though. And Colette like, hosted our, our uh, she emceed our, our gala, oh, Milan right. Revere, um, uh, Obama's appointee for ambassador for global women's issues. And, and she just highlights every demographic we need to reach. And that's How are we doing at lunch? It's time for lunch. Oh, it's time for lunch. <laughs> well, they took up all the time, but it was well spent. <laughs>